All right, before I introduce you to Dr. Trianti Filipulu, that's easy for you to say. <laughs> uh, two minutes. Uh, just a belated formal introduction to the program this morning and a conference. I'd like to welcome up Elaine Belden, the Head Commissioner from um, Health Education Wessex, and Jackie Kelly, our Head of Department from the University of Hertfordshire and a School of Nursing and Social Work. Thank you. Morning, everybody. My name is Elaine Bowden. I'm Head of Education and Workforce Development at Health Education England Thames Valley, and also work very closely with colleagues in Wessex, Health Education Wessex. Um, really pleased to be able to uh, be here today and to support the conference on behalf of Health Education England and the University of Hertfordshire, our single provider of learning disability education for Thames Valley and Wessex. Um, I'm a learning disability nurse by profession as well. Several colleagues in the room I trained with locally in Berkshire. Um, so it's really um, something that's very close to my heart, what we're all talking about today. I identify with what you all do on a day-to-day -day basis, the context in which, which you work, and um, what Lord Bradley was talking about earlier and the issues that he was raising with you all. Um, for us, Health Education England, Thames Valley, and nationally, learning disabilities much, much higher on the agenda now, and it's really great to be involved in the national work that's happening around the evaluation of the learning disability workforce and um, the development of the framework, transforming care for uh, people with a learning disability post-Winterbourne. I'm very involved in that national work, and um, there's now a lot of investment in training and education, so that um, relates to what Lord, Lord Bradley was just saying to you about the, the financial aspect and the need to invest to develop the workforce of the future and to develop the care for people with a learning disability. Um, in terms of that work locally, uh, I'm having a big workshop tomorrow with the CCG colleagues, with the local authority colleagues, to really look at developing a, le a leadership programme which is supported nationally, financially, and in terms of post-Winterbourne. Um, for everybody, all of you in the room will have access to that leadership programme. So hopefully tomorrow we can come out with a really good... Um, curriculum for you all and start that programme to be um, delivered in the next couple of months. So that's um, an exciting opportunity for everybody. Um, in terms of today, I really see today as an opportunity for you all to have some real interdisciplinary le learning and develop partnerships going forward and, and, and really forging some ways of working um, across the future. Um, and just have a wonderful day. <laughs> Thank you. I won't keep you very long. Um, I'm the reason we're slightly later on the agenda. My sincere apologies. I had the most horrendous journey here this morning, so um, I apologise for, for being slightly late. Um, and thanks to Lord Bradley. I really enjoyed the presentation. My name's Jackie Kelly, and as Paul said, um, I'm the Head of Nursing and Social Work at the University of Hertfordshire. Um, when I often say that when I'm in places like Basingstoke um, and uh, Reading and Oxford, people say, University of Hertfordshire? What are you doing in Basingstoke? Um, but as Elaine just said, we are the single provider for learning disability nursing, both undergraduate and postgraduate delivery um, across um, Health Education um, Thames Valley local office and Wessex, um, which stretches right down actually into the southwest. Uh, and we support the education and training um, of nurses um, right down as far as Dorset, um, as, as north um, as Milton Keynes. Um, right into uh, North London uh, with our commissions for um, North West London and uh, North Central East London and also for the East of England um, across Hertfordshire um, and we also have I think Paul some students from Norfolk these days. So we, we have a wide reach um, so hence the University of Hertfordshire um, is absolutely delighted to work in partnership with our um, commissioners um, and Elaine and I are, are, are getting into the habit of doing a bit of a Bill and Ben Act of, um, uh, of introducing these events which is um, a testament to the investment that continues to be made in supporting um, events like this um, to bring together different professional professions working um, with one aim to improve the health and social care support services for people with learning disabilities. Um, Elaine declared her um, background as a learning disability nurse and I'm also very proud to say that whilst I have a very wide remit at the University of Hertfordshire, I began my career too as a learning disability nurse working in South London. 
um, and further worked as a systemic practitioner working with families, working in particularly challenging um, circumstances. And I continued to be engaged in research within learning disabilities. So I'm very pleased to be able to say um, that the agenda for today is very close to my heart um, and, and is very much a part of my um, personal interest as well as professional interest. Um, as Elaine said, now, as she talked about you know, transforming care, there's lots of change going on um, within learning disability care. And I think one of the challenges um, in listening to Lord Bradley's presentation, um, and I think um, one of our colleagues' questions from the floor um, is an interesting one, is how we continue to invest in education whilst bringing collaboratively, bringing colleagues together to learn together, which I think is absolutely the way forward um, in relation to understanding how we work in different areas with a common interest to supporting individuals with learning intellectual disabilities to have better outcomes um, in their lives in whatever um, uh, nature of work we're doing. Um, but also there's a real challenge for us because um, I don't know whether you will share, but certainly from my professional experience, we are as learning disability nurses and indeed people with learning disabilities within services are often lumped together within mental health services. Um, and that is a real challenge because there is a significant vulnerability for people's mental health needs and there's an even a different vulnerability for people with learning disabilities who additionally have mental health and other needs. Um, and I think that's a challenge for services. I think it's a challenge for commissioners. I think it's a challenge for us as educationalists in how we package appropriate support to make sure that we're giving that diverse experience and education to people from a generic perspective. Um, so as Will Bradley was saying, those people who are sort of the passport controllers to putting people to um, direction towards the, the correct services um, have got that basic understanding, knowledge and awareness, but that equally we don't dilute some of the specialist services um, so that those assessments that need to happen um, at particular points um, in the care pathway are enabled to happen with skilled individuals being able to provide that service. So I'm not going to delay you very long. I'm also struggling with a bit of a, uh, a throat. So it really is my pleasure to welcome you on behalf of the university in partnership with our colleagues um, within um, the local office, um, Thames Valley and Wessex. I hope that you have a really productive day. I'm hoping to be able to stay um, into the afternoon, but I do have another um, commitment that will take me away um, before the end of the day. Um, it's great to be back at the Art Conference Centre. We had a really successful day, I think Mohammed would agree, last year, um, and I'm really glad that we've been able to, to um, bring this conference together. Thank you. If any of you had a horrendous journey as I had, well done for getting here, um, and I hope the rest of the day is uh, really positive from your perspective. We look forward to the evaluations. Thank you very much. Okay, we now turn our attentions to the second key speak speaker this morning. Uh, from the Tissell Centre and the University of Kent, um, we'll be hearing about OFSCA ID, or the Offenders and Social Care for Intellectual Disabilities, a research project looking at the costs and benefits of care and its effectiveness in preventing people with intellectual disabilities from offending. And to tell us more about that is Dr. Trianti Filopoulou from the Tizard Centre. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Very good pronunciation as well. Your Greek is excellent. <laughs> uh, I think you were rehearsing last night. <laughs> so thank you for having me uh, here today. Um, we were hoping that uh, Professor Glynis Murphy, who is the, uh, who is the grant holder, uh, would be able to do this presentation with me, but uh, she's in New York. Um, but I'm here, so uh, something I'm doing wrong there. <laughs> Or not. Uh, so this, this project is uh, funded from uh, NIHR, so it's a, uh, funded from the School of Social Care Research, and uh, this is our, uh, the team that we were working on. Um, so just a bit of, um, of background information. So between 1% and 7% in the UK prison population, they do have an intellectual disability. And... Um, People with learning disabilities have got loads of difficulties in prisons and uh, like understanding the information, everything is given up as a written information, so if someone is illiterate, uh, they would have a very hard time 
uh, understanding things, uh, like prison rules, how to make a phone call, uh, how to actually get a uh, hold of the doctor, how to actually uh, get a visitor in, unless you have, um, you know, you are able to understand the rules, you won't be able to get any visitors for the time that you're there. Um, and uh, they're socially vulnerable to bullying and anxiety and depression, but they're often seen as uh, troublesome. And um, that's what's happening when they, they are in prison. And then when they're leaving prison, um, what we tend to hear is that they're too able to get support from the uh, community learning disability teams, but then they've got insufficient mental health needs, so they can't get support from mental health teams, and then they're not very dangerous, so they can't get any help from the forensic teams and forensic services. And then uh, they're not eligible for social care because they don't fit to the fair access to care services. So where, do the, where, where, do, would, where does that leave them, really? And uh, as uh, the Bradley Report in 2009, and it's such an honor to talk uh, straight after you, uh, Lord Bradley, and uh, the, the review was to examine, to examine the diversion for people with learning disabilities and mental health needs. And the recommendations were clearly talking about the screening for intellectual disabilities within the prison settings, and uh, we're talking about the better uh, diversion from custody and the national strategy for rehabilitation. Um, has that happened? Well, uh, First of all, there's no routine screening on the entry on entry uh, to prisons. So there's some screening uh, being done by mental health teams in the prison. Um, then we've got the setting up of some liaison and diversion teams uh, who will screen some people for learning disabilities. Um, and then we've got uh, the R&D teams that they were national, national last April. And uh, then we're talking about the national strategy for rehabilitation. Um, so, but then everybody has been screen, screened um, or, you know, people have been, have been uh, screened on entry or not screened on entry only after people are suspecting a learning disability. So, what happens to people when they leave prison? So, do they get any social care or health support care or probation service support? Um, and these were the aims of, uh, of our project. So what, what, does, what is happening with social care or health care or probation input after leaving prison? Does that affect um, the way they are, their mood, their behavior, the quality of life? Uh, what about reoffending? What, what has that got an effect there? And what are the costs? So we're talking about costs and how, how expensive it is for people to uh, be in prison. But then what actually services we are providing after they leave prison and are we providing enough services so they don't end up back in prison? Um, so... Um, how did we plan to find our participants? Uh, that was a really, really hard study, really. Uh, this was a Department of Health pilot project that Professor Murphy did, and he's impressed now. And she was screening men for learning disabilities in three prisons over three months. So uh, all men entering prison were eligible, and 74% uh, were offered screening, and of those, uh, just 14% refused screening, but from those ones that they were screened, 7% they were screened positive. So these were 160 men from three prisons in three months. So we thought, what we need, we need 130 uh, people. Piece of cake, we thought. Not really. So, and here's the journey begins, uh, starting with uh, ethics and ethical approval. Um, integrated research. Not as much integrated, if you ask me. Uh, very time-consuming process, endless amount of paperwork, endless amount of uh, local approvals, procedures, they vary um, between organizations, like very confusing with the amount of NHS trusts and prisons we were working with. We had uh, multiple people being on the task. Um, and the time frame for research, uh, for research and development approval, the R&D approvals, for local NHS trusts took on average two months to approve. And then from prison sites, uh, the time that we received approval ranged from two hours to 11 months. 
Uh, so we had to knock and keep on knocking those doors. So what, what we did, so we planned, the initial plan was to work with three prisons. So we thought it's going to be okay, we'll be able to actually get the participants that we need. And three prisons and the associated NHS trusts. Um, actually, we ended up working across 22 NHS trusts and 27 prison establishments. Um, so the men screen positive for ID were recruited in prison and they were consented there. So we're, uh, we were using the uh, LDSQ. And uh, we see them, so we, uh, they, they were consented there, and we saw them when they were leaving prison, and uh, we planned for 130, but uh, the recruitment, as I said, was really difficult. So the care manager, apart from them, the care manager and the offender management manager were also invited to take part. And uh, the interviews with them, they were held in two time points. So time one was one month after they've left prison, and time two was nine months after they, they left prison. So the men were screened uh, positive for intellectual disabilities. They were interviewed at time one and uh, time two, and we were looking at their social network, uh, the surface, service utilization, their quality of life, um, the health and well-being, uh, looking at the depression rates, anxiety rates, and uh, whether they had re-offended or not. Whereas uh, the staff uh, members that were interviewed as well, just to verify the above, uh, to see whether uh, they could confirm things for us. Uh, but also, we were really lucky to have some service use user involvement. Uh, we were working with um, um, working for Justice Group, so they provided advice on the development uh, of the interviews and uh, the practical aspects of the study, like timing of the interviews, and uh, gave us the, an, an idea about uh, the issues that we wanted to tackle. Also, we had two service users on the steering committee, and uh, they helped us pilot our measures and uh, gave us a different perspective on things, but also kept us fo focused on what was important uh, for the service users. So, um, we're hoping for 130 people, but uh, only 89, oops, only 89 were referred to the project. Um, nine of them were unsuitable, so they didn't have a learning disability, or their sentence was too long, so they were not getting out of prison in time for us to include them. Um, ten of them, they declined consent, so uh, that left us with 60, 63 participants. Um, 48 of them were active or complete, so uh, we completed the interviews and everything, and 15 were missing in action. Actually, it was very, very hard, very difficult to, to keep in touch with people and keep track of their whereabouts. Um, so, time one and time two, some of the data that we had. So, um, the time one interview, so one month after the people left prison, uh, we had 40 people on that. And uh, for time two, uh, we had 23 people uh, taking part. So. Uh, nine months after they left prison. As you can see, the numbers have declined because we couldn't get hold of people. So they've either moved uh, they, or, you know, without any contact details and so on. So the mean age was uh, 34 years old and um, a time one, and their mean social network size was 27. So for someone without a learning disability, their, the mean social network size is around 90 to 150. So here we had uh, 27. Looking at the employment, um, from, from the people that we're looking at, three, only three of them were employed. Uh, like, for example, one of the guys that we were seeing was a cleaner uh, for two hours per week. And uh, four people were volunteering, like as a gardener or in a youth club, or another one was helping in a homeless uh, shelter. And one person was in apprenticeship. Um, all the rest of the people, they were unemployed. Um, and then the activities, as you can imagine, the activities that they were doing uh, throughout the day, they often had very empty days. There was nothing there for them to do. Uh, the typically very few activities, and the mean number of activities per week, that it was 3.7, uh, according to staff. So 
uh, around four activities per week for each person. Now, the living situation, 33% um, of them were living alone or with a family, 6% uh, they were supported uh, living, 12% um, they were with a 24-hour staff home, uh, 15 were in probation hostels, and 27% in secure units, uh, either low, low secure units or medium uh, secure units. Actually, that was, uh, it was one of the places that we, we could actually track people down, because they were going in secure units so we could find them. Uh, and then 6% they were back in prison, uh, by time one, that is. So one month after they left prison, they were already back in prison. Um, and here are the services that they received. Uh, so, as you can see, most of them, they had a probation officer, social worker, uh, a few less of them, and then a community and disability nurse. And uh, least of them had a psychologist or a psychiatrist involved in their care. Uh, so, how was their depression and anxiety rates? So, looking at uh, the depression, we use the Glasgow Depression uh, Questionnaire. So, uh, so that's the, Len the Glasgow Depression scale, and uh, it came out with 15. So that's above the clinical cutoff for depression. So the cutoff is uh, 13. So 54% of the men, uh, at time one, one month after they left prison, they, they were already depressed. And looking at the anxiety scale, again, the mean score for the, uh, for the anxiety scale was uh, 19, also above the, uh, the clinical cutoff, and 66% of the men uh, were above the cutoff point in time one. And what was the contact with the criminal justice system? 55%, they had been in contact with the police. Um, most of them, uh, it was about possible charges, uh, 25%, uh, it was just a checkup, that like just checking up if they're doing okay, which was fine. 32%, they didn't know why they were contacted by the police. 31% um, of those in contact uh, with the police, they were re-arrested and charged with one month, within one month of their release. Um, two men returned to prison within one month of their release and the contact with the police not significantly correlated it was not significantly correlated uh, to the restricted living situation. So, um, then looking at the contacts that people had uh, with, the, with, with the police, so it was significantly associated with having uh, some community health team support. So, and um, it was not, though it was not significantly associated with having a support, uh, a social worker, or uh, having a probation officer. So, um, and also being arrested and charged was not associated with any, any, any of the above. The living situation uh, now at time two, so nine months after they left prison, so 57% were still with family, um, alone or in supported, in supported living. 15% um, were in secure units, so that, that has dropped down from time one. Then 5% uh, were in probation hostels. Again, that has dropped down. And 18% were back in prison. So that has gone up again from time one. So that's nine months after they have left prison, 18% of them uh, they were back in. The social network uh, shrank to 17. So it was 20, uh, 27 at time one. And 87% uh, they were still unemployed. So now only one man was doing voluntary work. No one else was, was employed. Um, the depression score uh, was again 15, and the anxiety score was high. 68% again were both the cut off. Uh, the cut off that kind of remained the same between time one and time two. Um, then the support and the contacts with the criminal justice system at time two. So 70% they had uh, community health contacts, 53% they had a social worker, and 63% uh, had a probation officer contacts. Um, then a majority had contact with the police, so 47%, uh, quite a high percentage for possible offencing, <laughs> and uh, whereas 21% just checking up, and then remaining that, uh, that percentage there, not knowing why they've been contacted. 
Um, some of them, they have been arrested. So 32%, they have been arrested and charged. And uh, however, there was no association between the police contacts and the support uh, regarding health, uh, social support or probation support there. A few case studies that uh, I would like to share with you. Um, so it's, uh, the, these are two case studies that uh, pe with people that they didn't do any reoffending there. Uh, it's Mr. Family Support. So he was uh, known to prison staff as a repeat offender. So he, has, he had been to prison many times and um, he got support a time one interview. So he had probation and uh, drugs and alcohol service. Uh, in this case, his dad took him in and offered him a job at his workplace. So he, was full, he had a full-time job. He moved away from his social network in order to keep out of trouble. Uh, and he, he has not reoffended since release, but he's time to interview due now. So we, will, we are about to uh, contact him now. Um, so he identified his father as, he, as his key support. As you can see, the, this, this man was, um, was with his family. He had a full-time employment, so that had something to do, to do with uh, his, his not reoffending. Then Mr. Keep My Head Down, uh, he experienced imprisonment many times again. Uh, on this occasion, he was released early to serve six months license in the community. Um, service input that he had uh, from probation and AA support from a charity organization. And uh, he was under strict, strict uh, curfews and required to report to probation weekly, so kept an, a close eye to him. And the probation was also helping him to prepare for employment. Um, and his daily activities as reported by the participant was to stay in to keep myself out of tr trouble. But then we've got some case studies with people that re-offended. So it's Mr. Homelessness, who has been in prison a number of times and uh, requested help with accommodation and mental health issues before his release. And despite his request, uh, this participant was uh, left prison with, with no support, except from a peer support worker, from a, a volunt voluntary organization, and he was trying to help him find accommodation. Um, this participant remained homeless and reported to have been struggling with money, and uh, he was arrested seven times within one month of release, and uh, the participant was recalled to prison. No wonder. Mr. Piers then, uh, he, he went out in hostel accommodation, was sat up for him before leaving uh, prison. No other services offered uh, after prison release, just, just the hostel. Um, so he ran away from his hostel shortly after he was released. Um, he continued to sofa, so, sofa surf uh, at his friend's house and he was arrested four times with, by the police within one month of release. Um, he has been mugged and physically assaulted on two separate occasions and after his last arrest the police uh, placed him within the community risk management team. So he ha now has to report to the team on a regular basis. Um, this participant has returned to his hometown to live with his parents now. As you can see, most of the, most of the people, when we were going in and trying to uh, get all the information and the consent from prison, uh, as you know, um, people wouldn't have, they're not allowed to have any cell phones or anything uh, with them. And most of them, they wouldn't even remember the, the, the cell phone number that they used to have. Uh, or the, and we're trying to get information regarding their parents, uh, peers, a girlfriend or whatever we could get. Uh, most of them, they couldn't remember most of this information, so we're trying to just write out, down anything and everything. And then when they would come out, most of them, some of them, they would, uh, the, the relationships would have broken down. Um, so when we're trying to call the parents, the parents were saying, oh, I want nothing to do with him, don't talk to him about, don't talk to me about him. Or when we were trying to get the girlfriend involved, she was like, oh, no, I, I want nothing to do with him. So we couldn't really keep in touch with the, these people, and it was really, really hard to find them. Um, and this is why, you know, a, a good sample for us was the, for the people that, were, that ended up uh, either in secure units 
or back in prison. And most of the people that uh, they did well, they were the people that they were with the families again. Um, so general conclusions. Um, I'm afraid that prisons do not uh, routinely screen for learning disabilities. So if an offender does not self-report a diagnosis or has never been given a diagnosis, then they may not be identified as having a learning disability. Uh, you know, it's, it's been really hard for staff members as well in prisons. Resources, uh, they're not great. So it was a burden actually to keep on looking for us. Um, then prison staff resources, uh, as I said, are very, uh, very stretched and uh, understandably they don't necessarily have the time to accommodate research, obviously. Um, and then keeping track of the participants, participants were not released to a stable address, no phone, phones allowed in prisons. Uh, when we gain consent, the participants find it hard to recall the phone numbers and addresses of families. Um, and requests for support now, participants and their family members frequently complain about the lack of support and express um, understandable frustration about the situations. So what we are hoping to do next, we've got uh, Jenny Beecham, a health economist. Um, he's, she's just analyzing, she's just started the analysis. And uh, the conclusion so far is that this is a very, very vulnerable group that often don't get enough support. Many of them, uh, they could work if, uh, if they were supported. And uh, this is likely to re reduce reoffending. And it seems that having support from health team it helps reducing uh, their reoffending. So I just would like to thank all, all those in prisons, NHS and probation staff, and um, the ex-offenders, the participants themselves, for the help with this study. Uh, and thank you very much. I could take a few questions, I think. I've got time, five minutes. No, no, I'm afraid. Um, I was just asking if they um, had any information around women as well as men, although the focus of the research project was men. Yeah, so I'm afraid we didn't. Um, it was really hard to even find the men, and the men, the, the, the numbers of men uh, that they're in the criminal justice system having a learning disability, they're supposed to be higher than, than women. And it was that hard to find uh, male participants that we didn't, it was not one of our aims to actually start looking for females. But if it was that hard to tackle the men down, how hard it's going to be to tackle the, the, uh, the females down. So that's a study to come, I think. But uh, we would need, uh, <laughs> I don't know, loads of support and uh, you know, loads of people to come on board. And uh, start. The, this project started in uh, 2000. 2012, end of 2012, and we're just uh, wrapping it up now. Uh, it's just been tremendous, the, and the effort to actually try to get hold of the participants. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Because a lot of people would have learned disabilities if they had Mm-hmm. Sorry, it was subject. Yes, there were a few people, but I haven't got the data to actually, uh, to actually talk to you about that at the time being. We are just trying now to analyse. We're getting in uh, all the information. Yes, there were some people there, and uh, the, most of them, they were in the secure units, I think. They were placed in secure units, either high or, or medium secure units. I think that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. OK, thank you to both of our, our keynote speakers this morning. Lord Bradley's just about to take his leave. And thanks very much for coming. Um, I think that's given us a great foundation to build upon. However, our building will be a little bit slower than planned. 